I think we can start. So um, good morning to everyone and welcome to our webinar. And my name is Artitus Mani and I'm a Chinese teacher and a scenologist and also a member of the event team of European Guanxi. So today's event is about the role of Chinese language in building a professional career. And uh, this event were organi was organized by European Quency, which is a non-profit organization which aims to create a powerful um, networking among young Europeans interested in China and the Confucius Institute for Business London. And today with us, we have Martina Zuccarelli, which uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, the Confucius Institute for Business London. So I turn it over to Martina Zuccarelli. Thank you, thank you, Adita, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Um, as Adita just mentioned, uh, my name is Martina and I work for the um, Confucius Institute for Business London um, at LSE, and I'm here representing the, the Institute indeed. Um, so I just want to say, you know, just a few words about who we are and what we do for those of of you who haven't heard of us before. Um, so as all the Confucius Institute around the world, we are a partnership between two universities, one which is the London School of Economics uh, in London, where we are actually based, and the other one is a Chinese university, which is Tsinghua University in, in Beijing. Um, we have been the very first um, Confucius Institute uh, to focus on business Chinese uh, around the world, and that was mainly because uh, back in 2006, we were funded by um, five sponsoring companies, which are HSBC, BP, Deloitte, Y, and Standard Charter. So what we do um, here at the Institute, we we assist um, our profession students, our um, our business partners to um, to understand, to, to, to foster their uh, understanding, not only of um, Chinese language, but also um, Chinese um, business culture and, you know, assist them throughout, uh, throughout the journey. Um, we do this by a series of activities. For example, we organize a series of, you know, public lectures um, open to public, both online and offline, like something similar we're doing today with, uh, with European Guanxi. And we also do that uh, by providing executive education programs. Um, our main program currently is Chinese language language and culture for business. And in fact, uh, Ilan uh, today is um, actually one of our students representing uh, the course. So we're very happy to, um, to have him today as a speaker as well. Um, so without further ado now, I just leave it back to, to Adita so we can actually start with, uh, with the main event and we might um, get in touch later. Thank you, Adita, and thank you, European once again. Yes, thank you, Martina, for sharing with us uh, all this information. Uh, so, during this webinar, we will discuss the importance of Chinese language from two different perspectives. The one of us who use the Chinese language as an asset uh, for better and more job opportunities, and the one of who instead decided to build their career starting from the Chinese language. And for this reason, today we are really lucky to have two really great speakers, Ilaria Tipa, which is a brilliant uh, conference interpreter, and uh, Ilan Pass, who has a really outstanding career so we start, uh, before um, introducing Ilaria and uh, Ilan Bas, I would just remind to everyone that at the end of the session, there will be a Q&A session. So you can start typing your messages using the chat below and point out if you want to make the question by yourself. So just let me know in the chat or um, just let me know also if you want me to take the question for you. Okay, so. Let me introduce first Ilaria Tipa. She is the first Italian to specialize in simultaneous translation from Chinese into Italian, and is currently the only interpreter of the International Association of Conference Interpreters to use Chinese and Italian as a working language. She has really a great uh, working experiences as an interpreter, and she worked also for firms and institutions and is currently a professor in for simultaneous translation Chinese to Italian at the University of International Studies in Rome. But what um, distinguished Ilaria was that during uh, President Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping's state visit to Italy in 2019, she was the personal interpreter of the Italian President Mattarella. Uh, she's also the founder of Elite China Academy, which is a really interesting Chinese, uh, really interesting and really innovative Chinese language academy for sinologists. 
And uh, what about her education? So she uh, holds a master's degree in conference interpreting from the University of International Studies of Rome and a postgraduate diploma in marketing and digital communication. Then we know from Ilaria that she is really interested in traditional Chinese medicine. That's why she also pursued a three-year diploma in traditional Chinese medicine. While uh, Elon, from the other hand, uh, he also has a really outstanding uh, career path as he worked in several countries, including UK, China, and Israel, and in a lot of different uh, industries, um, like finance, government, and education. Here, his uh, studies path started in uh, uh, University of Sheffield, where he um, just took a degree in East, East Asian studies. And then he moved in uh, Tel Aviv uh, for uh, studying conflict resolution and mediation. He is a long, he's coming from London, and he started in London his financial uh, career. And then after that, he moved to Beijing uh, to undertake the, its um, graduate, uh, undergraduate studies uh, to learn Mandarin. After uh, a while, he also uh, worked uh, in NGOs, university in Israel, and then he turned back to Beijing to join the newly established Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, what is Elon doing uh, now is that he's a relationship manager for a company based in London and Hong Kong and helps senior executives to develop themselves and their leadership teams. So um, looking to these two really interesting profiles, uh, now we will start to know a little bit more about what they have done during their career and how they actually included Chinese language in, uh, in their work environment. So I first turn it over to Ilaria. So welcome, Ilaria. Thank you. Thank you, Ardita, for your nice presentation. And hi, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be here with all of you today. Just give me one second to share my presentation with you so that we have a background, let's say, to what I'm going to say. So there we go. Screen sharing. I quickly remind to everyone, just um, send me a private message okay. when you want to make a question. Okay. So can you see, see can you see the slides now? Yeah, now we can see the slides. Okay, very good. There we go. So as I was saying, it is a great, great pleasure to be here with you all today, albeit virtually. And I want to take the opportunity first to share with you my personal Chinese story, let's say. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to taking part to this very interesting discussion. I have to say, first of all, that it's a bit of an awkward sensation for me to be a speaker during a meeting instead of an interpreter. That is a role I am more used to, but I'm slowly getting used to be a speaker as well. So the first question here is, interpreter or speaking or speaker and today I'm going to be a speaker for you but as you will see during my presentation we will talk about interpreting quite a lot and let me begin also by admitting that I have been asked a thousand times how I ended up learning Mandarin Chinese and why I chose this language instead of many others well this is the first time instead that I have been asked what role did Mandarin Chinese have in, my, in the building up of my professional career? And this question actually gave me the chance to look at my career from a different perspective and to look at my personal bond with Chinese language from a different perspective. So I really want to thank the moderator, thank you Ardita, and thank the organizers for framing the topic of this webinar around such an interesting question. And now I will try to give this interesting question uh, hopefully as interesting or at least as some somewhat inspiring of an answer as it deserves. So as Ardita said in my introduction, and as I'm sure you've all read on the flyer of this webinar, I am a conference interpreter. And since last year, I have been the first member of the International Association of Conference Interpreters with Chinese and Italian as working languages. And I will tell you a bit more about this after. But I am also other things. 
such as an entrepreneur, a contracting professor, and a practitioner of Chinese medicine, as Ardita mentioned. But to explain how I've become all of these things and the role Chinese language played in it all, I'd like to share with you three life-changing moments, six elements, and three ingredients. So let's start without further ado with my three life-changing moments. For the first life, oh, sorry, for the first life-changing moment, we have to go back to my third year in high school. That's quite a long time ago. And at that time, I dreamed of becoming a writer or maybe a literary translator. Yes, I already had chosen, I wanted to work with foreign languages and my major at high school was actually foreign languages and I was studying English, German and French. And this is why at that time I wrote an essay and took part to a writing competition and I happened to win it. And the prize was a trip to the European Parliament in Strasbourg. During this trip, we had the chance to attend a plenary session in the parliament in the so-called blue room and at that time for the very first time in my whole life I met simultaneous interpreting and it was love at first sight so all of my dreams and on that very day changed and I wanted now to become a conference interpreter so I had quite a clear goal set even if I wasn't quite aware of what journey I had to take to reach it. So we could say that this first life-changing moment was pre-Mandarin. It means that at that time, I'm not absolutely sure I knew what China was or where it was and what Mandarin Chinese looked like. So this was a pre-Mandarin Chinese moment. And when I started my college career, I had my goal well set. I wanted to be a conference interpreter, working perhaps in a European institution. So I started my university with this very clear idea. But here comes my second life changing moment. And it was my first day in university. During my first day at university, I had to give up my German because my teacher said that since I have been working very hard on German during my high school, I had quite a high level of German, but the actually the university course started from the basics. So I would have find it quite boring just to become all over again with German, to begin all over again with German. That's why I decided to give up German. And on that very first day, I was looking sadly at the timetable and on the screen, I read Mandarin Chinese year one, lesson one, written in shining orange letters on the screen, class starting now. And I just decided to go and see. And this is how it all began. So I still had my interpreting dream, but I had a new overwhelming love for Mandarin Chinese. But it wasn't an easy path, of course, and I had two main questions I needed to address before even starting my learning journey. First, can someone like me, who is completely incapable of drawing, learn a language in which you don't write but draw? And can someone like me, who is completely incapable of singing, learn a language in which you don't talk but sing? These were quite tough questions to answer at the beginning, but it seems that you actually can. So I'm sure I don't need to tell you how tough it was to learn this fascinating language. And what I can tell you is that during my first visit to China back in 2010 or something, I nearly gave up and I wanted to go back home because of the cultural chaos I had in my mind. But likely I didn't. And I am here proud, proud proudly 10 years later to tell you that I'm so glad that I didn't at, the, at that time. And then we can go to my third life-changing moment. At the end of my bachelor's degree, I realized that I had to decide if Mandarin could fit into my interpreting dream or not. And I really hoped it could. So 
in the in the end it did because i found an ma in conference interpreting featuring mandarin chinese and i chose it and this is when that love at first sight of my first life-changing moment with simultaneous interpreting turned into a long-lasting and profound affection and became the main source of a singular mixture of anxiety and excitement in my life. This was also the moment of my third life-changing moment because there was no, no Chinese into Italian simultaneous course in my MA. Consecutive, yes, but simultaneous, no. And when I asked, and no matter who I asked, I always received the same depressing answer. It's impossible. Well, let me be very honest with you all. I've got an unsolved issue with impossible, with the word impossible itself. If you tell me that something is impossible, I really need to give it a try and decide for myself if, if it really is impossible or not. And so I did. And I can tell you now that it is very hard, yes, but impossible, no. So these were my three life-changing moments. And as you, see, as, as you have seen, Mandarin was key in two out of three of them. I started my professional career as an interpreter only a few months after graduate, graduating from my MA and living for a quite a long while in Taiwan. Things have not been easy, I can assure you. Being a known Chinese interpreter can be amazing, but it can also be a sort of a nightmare, you know. It can sometimes feel like you have to prove that you you need to be up to the task and you have to prove it every single time you're working and the pressure can be pretty intense. I work quite a lot nowadays in the private market as well as for government institutions, both in Italy and China. And over the years, I've come to specialize in foreign policy and international relations. And this is what I love most. But let me try to summarize for you the role Chinese Mandarin, Mandarin Chinese played in my in building up my professional career, but also my life as a whole, I would say. So these are the six elements of Chinese language that China the Chinese language brought through both my personal life and my career. So from a personal point of view, actually Mandarin Chinese changed my perspective on the world its workings and its history. It gave me the chance to develop a different identity with a different name, as probably most of you know, you have to change your name when you speak Chinese, you, you need a Chinese name so that Chinese people can call you. And another way of thinking, we could say, I absorbed another culture, another way of living, of eating, and another style of medicine. And it proved I can sing, at least if I follow the four tones in an early KTV acceptable manner. And also that I can draw at least understandable characters if I follow the proper stroke order. But thank God we use keyboards more than handwriting these days. So these are the main elements from a personal point of view. What about a more professional or career point of view? Well, Mandarin Chinese was key to fulfilling my dream of becoming an interpreter and reaching the highest possible level in a relatively short amount of time. As Ardita mentioned in her introduction, I have been working and I'm working for the highest level Italian institutions. And sometimes when I work, it makes me feel unique. And it gave me the push to teach others Chinese to Italian interpreting and actually Chinese language was the reason why I became an entrepreneur two years ago, founding the Elite China Academy, as Ardita said, the first online academy in Italy where Italian, spe Italian Chinese speakers can build their professional careers, including the role of interpreters. So last but not least, Chinese language gives, gives me the feeling that I'm never done learning and I'm always striving for personal improvement. So these are my six elements. And last but not least, I hope I'm not going too long. Okay, thank you, Yen, for your, <laughs> for your support. And so my three ingredients, and these three ingredients are can be seen as 
my little bit of advice for you all. Maybe you can, I don't know, find them somewhat inspiring or at least they can just give you a more complete view of what I think was very important in my journey with Chinese language. So the first one, ingredient, ingredient number one, that it's very important for my, let's say, Chinese language professional career recipe, it's perseverance. Think about the Chinese word for this. The heart that lasts. As you probably know, here, heart, in the very Chinese way of it, does not only encompass the idea of the anatomic heart or the feeling, but also the mind, the brain, so the workings of the mind. And perseverance here, it's the ability of never give up. Even when you're giving jellyfish noodles and you have to eat them just to save your and your friends or your clients face during a, a lunch or a dinner in China. Ingredient number two, hard work. Nuli. As you all know, this is one of the first words you learn when you start learning Chinese. And it goes always along with another one. That's 辛苦了. Right? Yeah. So these are the main, the very first things Chinese people tell you when you tell them you're starting, you're learning their language. And if you think about it, there's a good reason for that. Hard work and eating some sour bits. It's what, it's what it takes actually to attain a high level in Mandarin Chinese. And then we have ingredient number three, that is probably, I won't say it's the most important, but I think it's paramount. It's passion. And I really love the way Chinese language can describe things and feelings. And here we have two different words for passion in Chinese. The first one is qiang, and the other one is qiang. Well, why I've chose both of them? I have been, I have been thinking about which, which of the two can better describe what I mean when I say passion connected with Chinese language. And then I found out that I needed both of them. The first one, qiang, it's a warm feeling, literally. So it's a feeling of excitement, of enthusiasm. And you, it's very important because if you can find a job you're passionate and you're enthusiastic about and exciting about, maybe not all the time, but at least most of it, well, I think you've succeeded. And it's worth all the nu li, all the hard work and the hang xing, the perseverance you put on the way. So both of them, passion, meaning this warm feeling, this heartfelt passion, but also ji xing, the excitement, the passion seen as enthusiasm in what you do. And now I want to do something that I've always wanted to do, and I really like to do when I'm a speaker and I know that nobody is interpreting me, that is two quotes. Oh, sorry, I don't know what happened. Excuse me. I've got my two quotes, but I've lost them. You see, because this is because I'm an interpreter and the interpreter's biggest nightmare of all, it's quotes. So I want to make two quotes and the presentation doesn't work anymore because he knows that when I'm interpreting what I hate most, it's quotes. There we go. Okay. I really want to do my quotes. There we go. Ilaria, you, you muted yourself, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This is also an interpreter's fault because I always switch my mic, my mic off when I'm not talking. All right. So, I would like to end my speech with two quotes and knowing I'm not being interpreted, I can do it quite lightheartedly. And this is the first one. It's a quote by one of the businessmen I admire most, and probably you can guess who it is, but looking at the picture I've chosen, it's Walt Disney, actually. Mm -hmm. And the quote is, all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. The second one, justice be made comes from China, of course. And it's one of my Chinese favorite quotes. 
from Lao Tzu. Qian Li Jiqing Shi Wu Zu Xiao. Every thousand mile journey starts with the first step. So may all, you, all of you have the courage to pursue the important and paramount first step on your own thousand mile journeys to make your dreams come true, possibly with Chinese language in them. And that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. And thank you very much to you, Laria, for sharing with us such an inspiring um, personal um, career path and speech. Um, before we start with the Q&A session, uh, we also invite Ilan Baz. Uh, Ilan, hi, welcome. Hi, Ardita. Hi, Ilan. Yeah. Hi. So, okay. Yeah, I'll... Um, I yeah, I'll get started. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you uh, to European Guanxi and uh, CIBL LSE for, for this opportunity. Thanks also to Ilaria for that wonderful presentation. I mean, I have the unenviable task of, of following uh, Ilaria's uh, amazing career uh, progression and also amazing presentation. So I hope uh, this doesn't uh, disappoint too much. Um, so I am going to share my presentation. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Can every yeah everybody can see that? Okay. Great. So hi everyone. My name's Ilan. Oh, I'm going to set my timer as well. Um, I'm from London originally, but um, I'm I've lived in a few different places in the world, including of course the UK, China, Israel, and also Italy uh, during the pandemic. So um, yeah, I'm actually back in the UK now, and um, I'm going to take you through my presentation about um, uh, using Chinese language and culture in building a career um, from a perspective that's uh, most likely quite different from. Uh, Ilarius. So let me just give you a brief background of me. Okay. Um, in fact, I you know, I just did that basically. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to split my presentation into uh, a couple of different sections, the before China story, the China story, and the after China story. Then we're going to talk a little bit about why learning uh, uh, Ch Chinese is, is so important. Um, and then uh, basically we'll talk about, you know, how you can actually achieve that um, to uh, uh, um, uh, accomplish your, your objectives in your professional lives. So just a bit of context about me, the before China story. So I did my undergrad at the University of Sheffield. It was in um, the field of East Asian studies. Actually, um, I enrolled to do economics at Sheffield with um, Japanese uh, studies because I just come back from a couple of trips um, in consecutive years to Japan and was kind of blown away by the modernity um, and the efficiency and the and the cleanliness of, of the place. Um, you know, coming from the UK, we sort of I think have the, uh, you know, the feeling that, you know, we're a very developed country and you know very proud nation and all of that kind of stuff and then you go to Tokyo and you're like wow I mean this place is is really bright and and kind of vibrant and and modern and, and everything like that so when I got into my undergraduate degree I actually uh, so the people I met studying Japanese language were doing their major in East Asian studies and I sat in on a class that was about imperialism in East Asia so essentially about Britain and also other European powers involvement in uh, the region and specifically in China um, during the Qing dynasty um, and the opium wars, of course, that were sort of, you know, um, quite well known in that period of time. And I was quite shocked when I heard that it was uh, the first few weeks of university. I was quite shocked that uh, the country that I was from um, had sort of played quite a, uh, a, a you know, a, a controversial role in, in China's history. And so I switched my major from economics to East Asian studies and um, didn't look back. I, I really enjoyed my undergraduate degree and it certainly set me on the path to, um, you know, where I've gotten uh, today in my career, which is I've had some really interesting uh, working experiences. Um, but however, after I graduated, I went back to London uh, from Sheffield and I found work for a bank you know that's kind of what London's all about and that was you know the opportunity that was presented to me so I went and worked for an American bank uh, Bank of New York or BNY Mellon as it was became but this is important in the story because um, basically uh, you know 
BNY Mellon had quite a large office in Hong Kong. And I was sort of because of my undergraduate degrees, I was thinking, well, you know, maybe I should sort of be looking in, in that direction. You know, I want to I want to use my undergraduate degrees. I learned lots of interesting and useful things and I wanted to build on that. So I said to one of my managers at the uh, at the bank, I said, you know, I'm interested in working for the bank in in the region, uh, you know, potentially in Hong Kong in the future. You know, so, you know, how, how could I accomplish that? And I think together we sort of came up with the idea that I would take some uh, language classes. Now, of course, you know, people speak Cantonese in Hong Kong, but I, you know, for some reason uh, chose a Mandarin course at the um, uh, School of Oriental and African Studies in London. So I did that on the weekend, uh, on Saturday mornings, uh, every weekend for about a year. And actually the bank paid for it as well. So it was part of my sort of development um, uh, goals. And so they paid for me to, to go through that program at SOAS. Um, so that was sort of like my, my before China story. Now, I worked for the bank for about three years um, and I graduated 2005. I worked until late 2008. And some of you may know that at that time, the global financial crisis was sort of in uh, kicking into high gear and it was not a fun time to be working for a bank. Um, and so, you know, after I worked for this institution for three years, I was thinking, well, what am I doing here? You know, I, I don't I don't have a educational background in finance, you know, OK, sure, it's a job, it pays the bills, it, it you know, it does develop me in certain areas, but it wasn't it did. I, I, I found it lacked purpose. So I was like, I have to go and live in China and also learn Mandarin. Um, and so basically in early 2009, I packed up all my stuff in London. I got on a plane and um, I went to live in, in Beijing. I had no idea how long I was going to be there. At first, I was just sort of supporting myself teaching English, which is, I think, was kind of like a common way for, um, you know, foreign nationals to uh, sort of go to China. Maybe it's a little bit more difficult these days. Um, I went out there and was teaching English and then sort of I did that for about a year or so and found also that, you know, that wasn't my calling. And so I took the opportunity to do some full time uh, Chinese uh, studies, which I did at Tsinghua University. Um, and I did that only six months, but my Mandarin kind of like, you know, really exponentially uh, improved um, during that time. And then I was quite lucky in that I was just sort of looking for work and I happened upon an advert. Um, I saw that the British Embassy was hiring for people in their visa section. I applied for the role uh, and I was lucky to get it. Um, I went through quite a rigorous um, interview process with like a security screening and all of that kind of stuff. And so I started my first role at the British Embassy as an entry clearance officer. So making decisions on Chinese nationals visa applications to go and, and live and work and uh, study in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and actually, I ended up having a couple of roles at the embassy. My second role um, was as a customer liaison officer, and that was sort of more about going out in the Chinese community, explaining visa policies and services to the Chinese public. And I actually, I, I, I know pretty much um, for a fact that I got that role because my Mandarin was much better than, you know, other people's in the, in the, in the embassy, or at least in that part of the embassy. Um, and so I was selected for that role because, you know, I, I was already a little bit conversational in, um, in Mandarin. So yeah, I'll come back to that point a little bit later. Now I put the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank there. That's actually kind of more part of my, um, you know, after China story, um, but I'll come back to that. But basically, after working at the embassy for a couple of years, I was in uh, Beijing for you know almost five years. I was kind of feeling, you know, I was getting a little bit comfortable again, and I wanted to do something different. And I basically sort of made the decision to leave China, um, you know, get some distance, maybe sort of like be able to process that experience of living in China for almost five years. And so I went to do a master's degree in Israel, which is actually the country that I was born in. Um, and so I, I, I chose a field that I was sort of just quite interested in. And that field was... So it's public policy. And I think my experience at the embassy sort of influenced that. Um, but it was a special program in conflict resolution and mediation. And being somebody who was born in Israel, an Israeli citizen, I felt that, you know, I had to actually um, go to that country and sort of learn about, you know, the conflict with um, the Palestinians and also, you know, the wider uh, region um, and sort of see if I could, you know, get involved in, in things that were going on there. So I did that. Um, and, you know, 
uh, I think what's interesting about this part of the story is that when I got there, because of my experience in China, I found that it was very easy to network with people who were interested in China, so Israeli people or other foreign people who were interested in China, but also the Chinese community that were living in Israel as well. So um, I think you know my China experience kind of it 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 gave me the idea that you know. I was sort of like a foreign person who had a background in East Asia and China, and so that kept on moving me in a certain direction. Now, I lived there for a few years, and I didn't immediately start working in the field of conflict resolution. Um, I actually had a good opportunity to go back to Beijing, which, as I said, was at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And again, I think I was selected for that role. It was actually very early in the bank's um, uh, existence, only two years, and I'm 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 pretty sure I was the 81st member of of staff of the of the bank, and I'm pretty sure that I was selected for that role because of my uh, experience of of living and working in China and my Mandarin language skills as well. So from that time, I've kind of moved back and forth a little bit from you know, China and the UK and Israel and Italy during the pandemic. And I've tried during the pandemic, I was actually before I was based in Shanghai and I was I went to Israel to deliver a mediation workshop and I got stuck outside of the country and I was not able to go back. So I, I moved to Italy, which is where uh, my mom lives, and I basically just became self-employed. So I started thinking, you know, how can I differentiate myself as a mediator? Because there's quite a few mediators out there and, and not a huge amount of, of work that kind of spreads around. And so basically I thought that I can differentiate differentiate myself by focusing on cross-cultural disputes with a, a special focus on China um, and Chinese speakers. And so this icon up here in the top right is actually a company that I have founded recently called Orchid Mediation, Ilan Tiaojie. So Ilan is sort of like my part of my Chinese name and Tiaojie means mediation in, in Chinese. Um, and so basically I am going to be uh, focusing on using my skill set as a mediator um, and my Mandarin language skills to basically, you know, be a bridge between the East and West and to build, uh, facilitate dialogue and build understanding and with the uh, ultimate aim of resolving disputes. And that's what I was doing during the pandemic. But then basically I had um, a good opportunity to return to London and uh, I've actually just started working for a company called Critical Eye, which they call themselves, well, we call ourselves a peer-to-peer -peer board community. So we help very senior executives um, develop themselves and their leadership teams. They have a small office in Hong Kong. And again, they're definitely moving in that direction. They want to serve, you know, the sort of like, you know, the senior executives who are uh, working in uh, uh, ch uh, China and the region and also Chinese executives um, as well. So again, I think that my, my experience uh, working in China and my Mandarin language skills have led me to, to be selected for quite an interesting role at a very fast growing uh, up, up and coming company. So that's me. Um, why is learning Chinese important? Well, you know, I guess I probably don't have to tell many people in in the audience here. Well, why why is it learning? What why is it important? I mean, there's China, which is an enormous country with a, a very large economy, fast growing, uh, lots of opportunities inside China. I mean, it's it's probably almost one fifth of the the global population, um, and so you know there's going to be always opportunities for foreigners who can speak Chinese and Mandarin in China. And then, of course, you have the opportunities outside of China. So then you've got the whole world that you can be a bridge between, it between you know speaking Chinese, you know between non-Chinese speakers and Chinese speakers. Um, and so you can do that in, in the countries that you are living in. Um, and then of course, you know, China is involved in basically every field and profession. And so if you're a, a Chinese speaker, you can basically go into any direction you want to go to. Uh, and essentially as well, to, to future-proof your career. So with my example of um, mediation, um, you know, there's not many foreigners who do mediation and who speak Chinese. So I, I, I've put myself in a very small group of, of people. And so that kind of creates opportunities um, for developing yourself. So, you know, what, what should you kind of focus on in terms of learning uh, Chinese? Well, I think, look, you know, it depends, of course. So think about, you know, why are you learning it? You know, 
what are your interests and and you know what do you need it for so think about where the gaps are where you can sort of like you know get you know use your your chinese uh, uh language you know interest of china to to sort of you know break into in the, into the market and also i just wanted to make the point here that you can also divide it based on geography i mean you can you know learn mandarin of course that's basically every chinese person's you know first or second language but if if you specialize in a regional dialect like cantonese or shanghainese you can actually put your yourself in a very very small group of foreigners who can speak to a big local population um, and of course you know you can tailor your learning to your experiences so I'm actually a student on the Chinese language and culture for business course at, at CIBL at the moment and so I'm learning the language around conflict resolution and around uh, mediation so with that I want to show you this video which is called conflict resolution in China by Mama Huhu I know I'm running out of time but this is a very short video so here have a look at this video uh, which is called problem or no problem your wenti has your male wenti wow but Hashan 能够控制对吗 就是来，只有他自己有钱，他又没法从里面打开容器。换一个想法说，会不会有问题，还是是没有问题？中国有句老话，没问题是吗？孔夫子说，是了，是的，没问题。我们的货完蛋了。Okay. <笑> Okay, okay, so that was Conflict Resolution in China by Mama Hu. So I'm, I'm pretty much out of time, but the point of showing you that video was is that, um, you know, learning Chinese is going to be incredibly important for if you work for, you know, government agencies or companies, you know, solving problems, you know, understanding each other is, is going to be vital in, in the future as we move forward in this world of inter interdependence. And just finally, I just wanted to end on the, char the traditional character of uh, listen to listen, Ting. Uh, you can see that the constituent parts in Chinese are made up of, of various different um, concepts. Eyes, ears, complete, whole, heart, and, and ruler. So the concept of listening in, in Chinese is, is a very important one. So basically, when you're figuring out why you should, you know, be learning Chinese and, and, and your journey uh, to China, you know, listen to yourself and listen to others. And I'm sure you will do really well in, in your careers. And, and just as a final word, listening is the key skill in mediation and resolving disputes between people. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much, Ilan, for sharing with us your really enriching uh, experiences. And uh, I must say that the personal thing is, um, it was a really inspiring <laughs> Saturday morning, seeing your two different perspectives and having the opportunity to see in how many different fields we can use actually Chinese and uh, how important it is also to learn the culture of Chinese language in one side and to, to understand it from a global perspective, so not just the country, um, country focused perspective. So we start now with the last, uh, uh, I must say, 15 minutes, I hope, um, with the questions. And uh, um, let me take the question. I, I have one question for Ilaria first. So I will start with Ilaria. Um, okay. Because we want to know, since you have really long experience with uh, conference uh, interpreting, I want to know what are the most relevant features of interpreting from or into Chinese that other Western languages do not have? 
Yeah. Well, you said we have 15 minutes for doing an all Q&A and I would like use a couple of hours to answer this question alone, but I'll try to keep it very short. I think that we can summarize the difference between interpreting between Western languages and European languages and Chinese and European languages. So it doesn't really matter if we're thinking about Italian Chinese or English Chinese or French Chinese. I mean, there's one word that can, sum can summarize very well the main difference, it's distance. I mean, the distance we have from a structural point of view, from a cultural background point of view, and for everything, I mean, it's distance. And it's a huge distance we have between Mandarin Chinese and the way of thinking as well. We think in a different way in West in Western countries, let's say, and it's a very Chinese way of saying it. So it's like si fang guo jia. In the Western countries, what we do, is thinking with our cultural background, our, our own culture and our own way of thinking. And meanwhile, you can not always, but at least a little bit, use your very own way of thinking, switching between different European languages and you still have, at least you can be understood. I mean, when, I'm, when I speak English, probably Ian thinks that, there's something that is a bit awkward and you can see it, it comes from my Italian native language, right? But if you do it with Chinese, it doesn't work. I mean, if you use your Italian way of thinking and try to use the Chinese words to say the words, it doesn't work. It will never work. Yes. And they don't understand you. That's the, the real problem. Meanwhile, in English, if I'm using an Italian st structure, way of thinking, you can at least you can understand the basic message. But you mean because, yeah. yeah, of course, I can make some mistakes, probably grammar mistakes or structural mistakes, but you can still get the point. And I think the video Ian showed us, it's the best example of all. I mean, they're speaking the same language, but they're not really speaking the same language. That's yeah. the real point. And this is the greatest difference difference and also the most difficult thing when we do interpreting between Chinese and Western languages. And it doesn't matter if you're working simultaneously or consecutively, you always have to first really understand what they do say. And what I always, I always tell my students in my interpreting classes is that you have to first listen, as Ian said, and I was very inspired by your presentation, Ian, and you have to understand first, you have to listen, understand, and only afterwards you can translate, you can interpret, only afterwards. First you have to listen and understand what they say, what they really want to say, and sometimes what they want to say and what they actually say, it's not the same. So you have to understand what's the message, not the words, but the message. And in Chinese, working from Chinese into European languages, it's very hard because sometimes if you don't have a really good mastery of Chinese language, it's hard to understand what they really mean. And you know that this is something I would like to share with you. It's that most of the times and mostly in institutional fields and Ian has been working in the embassy, so probably knows it very well, what the Chinese people like to do is to let their interpreters work yeah. from Chinese into the European language. And they let other, the, the other side interpreters work from the European language into Chinese, even if they know very well that a Western Chinese will never be as good as a native speaker's Chinese. But they are afraid. They're afraid that you do not understand completely the message they deliver and you do not translate it very well. So they think that listening to your native language, your for sure you will understand the message and you will, you will be able to deliver it, even if your delivery will not be the best of all. And I, and I stop here. Yeah, I take the opportunity to ask uh, Lisa for the funniest questions, which actually ask us, uh, which, what do you think is necessary, which, which level of HSK you think is necessary to work the actual level? So is it the HSK 5, 6, uh, she's asking, or the new HSK 7 to 9? Can I say no HSK? No, it's okay. Yeah, I also agree. 
um, then no, it's not an NHSK level problem here. It's like over HSK. I mean, it's not that you have to go. I mean, what you need to develop, it's not an HSK based way of thinking. HSK is good for applying to jobs when it's required. And it's a good way just to give you a sort of measurement of your Chinese skills. But it's not all. And sometimes, even if you have a very high HSK level, it doesn't mean that you have, you know, the features you need to become an interpreter. Hmm? Thank you. And I have a question for Ilan now, um, which is, uh, since you have worked in such diverse business environment and industries and so much different, in which business industries or uh, work environment you have worked in, you think Mandarin is must have? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really depends like what your exact role is. I, th I think it could be any industry. I mean, you know, for my first role at the embassy, it was totally unnecessary. I was making decisions on visa applications. So, you know, the level of Chinese was almost non-existent to do that role. But the second role at the embassy, where you're going out and speaking with the Chinese public, you know, various stakeholders, the business community, the education community, um, the travel community, you know, you can get by with English, but it really, really helps if, if you can have conversations in, in Mandarin. Um, you know, my role at AIIB, so I was kind of working, I was doing security and, and travel management and, you know, working uh, with the embassies, the foreign embassies of the member countries didn't need Mandarin, but working with the vendors, you know, like companies like Air China, they would always conduct their meetings in, in Mandarin. And so I had to be able to be able to understand what was going on and, and, you know, maybe, you know, ask a few questions myself. So that was, you know, kind of like my role was sort of like split between, you know, needing no Mandarin and really needing a very high level of, of Mandarin. So, yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, for my own kind of personal uh, business that I'm, I'm uh, launched, um, sure like if i want to do mediation between chinese people then then that will be um quite uh, quite necessary um yeah so it, it it really all depends it all depends yeah um thank you so i think uh, i mean maybe we have like five minutes to answer a last short question um and uh, let me check so there was um Marco Luigi, who actually wanted to ask you, Laria, uh, if when you started your uh, career as an interpreter, since you have moved from different uh, different times, so uh, you have been studying another thing and then you changed over a smart window of time, said, and he is also asking if it's still possible to work with languages even without a specific sectoral certification? A specific what? Sectorial certification. Um, I'm not really sure I understand what does he mean by this, but I'll just answer to the first part of the question <laughs> in the meantime. Yeah, maybe he can, Marco, if you can just maybe I specify a little bit more. He um, said, uh, he'd like to work in the context of translation and localization, but uh, he's simply on a general language certification and a degree in Asian language and culture. But he had okay. people actually are sending specific courses aimed to, to that job. So like you said, you need to be prepared for uh, in conference interpreters. You have to mm -hmm. focus on the skill. Uh, okay, so we're talking about translation, not really interpreting here, right? Uh, I think, yes. OK, so for um, I just answered to the first part of the question about when I started my career. And as I said during the presentation, I did it after the end of my MA. So after finishing my MA and I had a year and a half in Taiwan between the, um, let's say, when I was working on, on my final dissertation and my final thesis for the MA, I have been um, for a year and a half in Taiwan, and then I came back to Italy. And after that, it was in 2013, 
no, nearly 10 years ago, eight years ago, yeah. And I started it. I've started working as an interpreter just straight on after the end of my studies. And now I've never, well, I had some different um, working experiences. I have been working as a consultant for businesses, but my real objective, my real goal has always been to become a conference interpreter. So even if I've done something else in the meanwhile, it was always aimed to become a conference interpreter. And yeah, that was my main objective, as, you, as you've seen since the first year in high school. So, And for the certification part, and I don't know if he's talking about Italy or somewhere else, because things are different in different countries. In some countries, you have to pass an exam to become a conference interpreter or a certified translator. But if we're talking about Italy, in Italy, we don't have a um, specific exam for in professional interpreters and translators. Okay, I was referring to the fact that a lot of people apply for specific courses like masters in mediation, interpreting, and so on. Now, companies do not give a lot of importance to the name of your degree, let's say, but to your real skills. So if you're really able to do something very well, that's what is important. And it's not only the name of the certification you have that it's important. And according to my experience, I don't know if probably Ian has a different experience on this, but according to my own experience, Nobody really went through my CV back to the, you know, to the name of my university degree. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he also thanks you very much. I think it was really clear. Um, I think we uh, are near an hour of time. So um, I will end up here our Q&A session. And thank you again for both of you and also to Martina uh, for uh, accepting to, to talk during this webinar. Uh, I just remind that if anyone would like to connect, uh, you can find uh, Ilan, who just said in LinkedIn, but also Ilaria has a personal page. And you can ask them directly your questions if you have more questions that we, hadn't we didn't have time today to, to answer. Um, and uh, I also invite Martina Zuccarelli, if you can stay, that we want to <laughs> thank you again for the last time. Thank you, Adita, and thank you to our, to our speakers. I just want to second what you've mentioned uh, a moment ago. It's, it's been a very inspiring Saturday morning, so I'm going to roll up my sleeves now and get back at studying Chinese. <laughs> so thank you. I want to thank Sina, really, again, the speakers for, for this inspiring uh, presentation and European Guanxi for, you know, um, helping us out to organize this event. And I hope there will be more occasion in the future to develop um, the importance of, you know, Chinese so um, that's all. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to, to add something else. Otherwise, we just, yeah, Yelan. Oh, I, I just want to say thank you um, to European Guanxi and to um, uh, CIBL at LSE. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And it was lovely speaking. Yeah, yeah for me as well. Thank you very much to you all. And thank you, Yen, for your presentation as well. <laughs> thanks, Hilary. You too. Great. So um, have a nice weekend to everyone, and I hope we can keep in touch and have opportunity to, to make another event soon, maybe. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, and goodbye, everyone. Have a Bye. nice weekend. Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye. Bye.